Hello, and welcome back to my series on recreating A Link to the Past. In any Zelda game, you have a vast world to wander around and dungeons to explore. In order to make this experience immersive, there's going to be obstacles to avoid and objects to interact with. In our game's current state, Link can walk around, but he can just go through any walls in his path. Obviously, we're going to want to make our walls solid and force Link to stop when he walks into them. There's several options for how we could go about doing this. We could manually calculate the collisions ourselves, we could install some kind of collision detection library, but in my opinion, the simplest way to do this is to utilize a physics engine. For example, with Box2D, a very common physics engine, we could give Link a hitbox, give all the walls a hitbox, and the collisions would be automatic. Box2D would prevent us from walking through the walls. To make this process even easier, I'm going to be using this open source library called Windfield, which is a Love2D specific package that simplifies using Box2D. Our first step in getting physics implemented is to create our physics world. The world is what contains all the physics objects that we create, like the player and the walls. With this world now available, we can use it to create our very first physics object for the player. Using Windfield, every physics object in our world is called a collider. If you're familiar with Box2D, a collider contains the body, fixture, and shape all in one place, so it's really easy to manage. Our collider can have any shape we want. In this case, I'm making it a circle. Then we specify its position, and then the radius of the circle we want this hitbox to be. 40 is a decent size, so we'll try that out first. Before we run this game, we need to make sure that we update the world in our update function, and if we want to see the colliders that we're creating, we can draw the world as well. With that in place, this is what we'll see. Link now has this white circle around the base of his body. This is the collider that we just created, and it will act as Link's hitbox. The end goal is that every enemy, NPC, and object will have a collider just like this. Now, a problem we'll see right off the bat is that the collider does not stick with Link. As it is now, we have a player.x and player.y, and we're simply drawing the animations to these coordinates. What we should actually do is draw the animations to the position of the collider instead. We can get rid of player.x and player.y completely. From now on, we'll always be tied to the collider. But of course, without player.x and player.y, we can no longer move around. We need to rework the key press sections so that rather than updating player.x or player.y, it'll make the collider move instead. We could make this the same way as before, where we update the collider's x and y positions for each key press, but there's actually a better way to do this. Every collider has a velocity, and we're able to manually set this velocity at any time. For the key press of right, for example, we could set the velocity to move in the right direction. But how does this work? What do these parameters even mean? Velocity is represented using a vector. A vector is a quantity that has both direction and magnitude, and you can represent a vector using an x and y value. Take the vector 1, negative 1, for example. To visualize the vector, we need to plot the point 1, negative 1. Just as a reminder, the y values increase downwards in game development, that's why negative 1 is up here. So, with this point on the grid, we can draw an arrow from the origin to that point. And that's our vector. It has a direction going up right, and its magnitude is the length of the arrow. With that in mind, we can set the velocity for right by using the vector 1, 0. Left will be negative 1, 0, up will be 0, negative 1, and down is 0, 1. But that's just the direction. Vectors also have magnitude, or how long they are. In this case of velocity, the greater the magnitude is, the faster Link will move. In these examples, the magnitude is 1 meaning Link will only move one pixel per second. Not even per frame, per second. This is obviously way too slow. In reality, I'm going to make the magnitude be around 300, or 300 pixels every second. This is how it'll look for right, left, up, and down. 
This method of movement will work, and we can move again, but an issue we'll run into is that we can't move diagonally anymore. This is because each of the key presses will set the velocity to that particular direction, and that's it. We need to get a bit more creative to get diagonals working. How about instead of setting the velocity in each of the key presses, we instead update an x or y value. Then, after all the keys have been checked, we'll use the resulting values to set the velocity that way. With right, for example, we'll change this vector x value to 1. Left will set it to negative 1, down will set vector y to 1, and up will set vector y to negative 1. So in the end, we'll have each axis accounted for. So if, say, right and down were pressed, that would mean vector x is 1 and vector y is also 1. So the resulting vector will be facing down right. Then, in addition to using these values for the velocity, we're going to multiply them by 300. This will make Link move faster, otherwise he'd just be moving by 1 pixel per second. And with that, our movement is back to normal. However, the animations are always stopped. We need to fix it so player.isMoving can be true again. Instead of checking the player's position like we were doing before, we can directly check these vector x and vector y values that we set in the key presses. If they're both zero, that means none of the directions are pressed, so we should stop moving. Otherwise, is moving will be true. Easy fix. Now, the whole point of this video was to get collisions implemented, but we actually have already accomplished that. By using Box2D and having our player map to a collider, collisions with other colliders will automatically be handled. To demonstrate this, let's put Link somewhere with more stuff to run into. Now, let's create some colliders and put them right on top of these statue guys. Also, we'll make their body types static. This is important. All walls and obstacles will be static, which pretty much means that they won't move or won't be affected by other objects running into them. The default body type is called dynamic, which is what Link is. These kinds of objects move around and are affected by collisions. Now, with this all set up, Link will stop whenever he tries to walk into these objects. Really? Anywhere in our game where we want Link to stop, like the walls or closed doors, we can just set up a static collider and Box2D will take care of the rest for us. And we can turn off the collider drawing. This is what the game looks like. We're setting ourselves up pretty nicely to create a world that Link can explore and interact with. As always, the code for this project is available on GitHub. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching this video! We're still in the very early stages of this game, so if you want to see where it goes, be sure to subscribe.